I would like to thank all of you who, in spite of hangover and the rain, came to this wonderful venue. But now I'm going to make your life even a bit harder. I would like to ask all of you to stand up now. Just put your laptops aside. Just stand up, all of you. Don't be shy. That's it. Now, I want to ask all of you to raise your right hand. If you don't remember where is your right hand after hangover, just take a look at your neighbor. All the right, hand, right hands. Now, raise your left hand. And now, a round of applause to yourself for getting here today. Thank you. And now, a round of applause for the organizers of this event, please. Thank you. That's it. Enough with the physical exercises. <laughs> How long is forever? Sometimes it's just one second. This dialogue between two fiction characters by Lewis Carroll and his Alice in Wonderland could easily happen nowadays between two absolutely real people talking about web performance. Because as we will see later in the talk, performance is a really subjective matter. Those of us who started working with web in the beginning of 2000s might remember that web of that time was perfect. It was terrible from the developer's point of view, but from the user's point of view, it was perfect. All the sites looked the same. All the sites behaved the same. For example, eBay of 2001 looked almost identical to any other site out there. Yeah, there were centered sites, there were full width sites, but all of them looked and felt the same. And the most important part is we, as developers, didn't think and actually didn't care at all about web performance back then. Fast forward 15 years, and this is how eBay looks in 2016. Amazon of 2001 and Amazon of 2016. Arngren of 2003 and Arngren of 2016. <clears throat> Just a warning, this is a real site. Don't try to load it on your devices now because it will eat all your roaming and mobile data and all, this thing, all these things because it's monstrous. But as we saw with these examples, some of the sites came really, really long way from the beginning of 2000s to 2016. And it's not only the design that has changed. Now, at the events like this one, we seriously talk about unlimited and powerful possibilities that a web platform gives us. But in order to provide us with all these possibilities and unlimited options, web of the beginning of 2000s had to change. From the intelligent and a little bit hip young man, web turned into the well-fed, bloated guy. For example, an average size of a page in 2003 was only almost 94 kilobytes. And this is the point where we didn't care about performance. But time flew. And now in 2016, it's already two and a half megabytes. <clears throat> two and a half megabytes is the average size of an average page on an average site. At the same time, we constantly got recommendations from the industry leaders about how fast we should load our pages. For example, in, in 1999, it was recommended to load the page in eight seconds. In 2006, we were talking about four seconds. 2012, two seconds, and now, in 2016, we are really talking about loading pages in one second. And this combination of loading a page of two and a half megabytes within one second is the point where we simply cannot ignore performance. We have no right. Um, this, is, this point is being proved by a lot of statistics. Statistics like this, for example. Amazon and Walmart and things. 
But I'm not going to talk to you about these statistics today because you can find this literally in every talk and every article on web performance with exactly the same brands. I'm not going to talk to you about these statistics because these statistics is all about money. Not every project we're working with involves money, but every project we're working with involves user. So today, I will try to give you a little bit different perspective on what we call performance, and we'll try to put user in the center of our discussion. We will see what performance is for user, why performance matters for user, and how we can manage performance in the most efficient way for user. And to begin with, I will replace this money-based statistics with user-based research. In 2010, company Forbians conducted a research called Web Stress, a wake-up call for European business. The research involved EEG, electroencephalography, and some video recording techniques. <clears throat> and the core of the experiment was there were two groups of the participants. One had to uh, finish an online transaction on a normal internet connection, five megabits. And the second group had to finish exactly the same transaction on a slowed down connection, two megabits. The result of this research revealed that those on the slow connection had to concentrate up to 50% more in order to finish exactly the same online transaction. Later in 2013, company Redware conducted the same type of research, but for the mobile users. Again, two groups of participants, but one is on the normal side, finishing the transaction, and another group is on the artificially slowed down side. The slowdown was only half a second, 500 milliseconds. The result of this research was that those on the slower side had to up to 26% higher peak frustration and up to 8% lower engagement. This is quite a lot, but the most important discovery of this research was that this half a second slowdown affected not only performance-related characteristics of the site, but those beyond this. It affected perception of the design, it affected perception of the content, and th what is more dangerous, it affected the overall perception of the brand in general. Just imagine this. Half a second delay of one page affects perception of the whole brand. But then, in 2011, there was a really interesting survey conducted by Harris Interactive uh, on 2,000, 2,500 US residents and 2,500 UK residents. And during this mobile transactions survey, 23% of the users confessed that when they experienced a slow site, they cursed at their device. 11% Confess that they were screaming at their device and wait for it. 4% literally threw their device because of a w slow website. This is incredible. All of this happens because simply people hate waiting. People just hate to the point that in some countries with the high level of bureaucracy, for example, Russia and Ukraine, there are special services called tramitadors. The service where you can call and book a person to stand in line instead of you. People are willing to pay money to somebody to stand in line instead of them. This is mind-blowing. This is how badly we hate to wait. But there is one thing. People hate waiting unless they don't notice the wait. Let me give you one example. This is the data for gizmodo.com. <clears throat> and if we will take a closer look at the numbers, we will see that page loading time is almost 20 seconds. Visually complete, 20 seconds. Fully loaded, more than 22 seconds. Oops. This has to be some crisis. Probably this site is in desperate need for optimizations. But I think there is something wrong with this data, because gizmodo.com is the site that during the last 30 days has gained more than 106 million unique views. This is huge. So 
I guess there is something wrong with this data. Let's put this data aside and see how the browser, uh, how the uh, web page is loaded in the real web browser. So we type in URL, we click Enter, and the site is almost instantly here. What happened to those 20 seconds? Well, we'll get back to this example a bit later in the talk. But for now, we have to understand one important thing. The absolute numbers, like milliseconds, number of server requests, kilobytes, and so on and so on, even though are an indispensable part of what we call performance these days, they do not constitute performant or in performance site on their own. Because performance uh, is not about mathematics. Performance is all about perception, how your users perceive your site. And today, we are going to talk a bit about perception. Um, this was nicely put by Steve Souders. The real thing we are after is to create a user experience that people love and they feel is fast. And so we might be front-end engineers, we might be dev, we might be ops, but what we really are is perception brokers. So today, we are going to talk about perception. And in this journey, we will employ the most interesting and powerful tool available at our disposal, not as developers, but as human beings, our brain. And let me begin with one example. Ciao, amici. Wonderful conference so far, and I hope that my voice doesn't make things any worse. In spite of the fact that I deliberately delayed the sound of this clip by 100 milliseconds. You won't notice it anyway because our brain is really good at merging information it gets from five of our senses into one consistent perception to compensate for any delays. Unless the delays become unbearable, and in this case, we experience this annoying effect of delayed sound. Your turn, buddy. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Um, indeed. More than 86 billion neural cells in our brain. This is one of the most beautiful and perfect computers ever existing. And still, our computer doesn't notice the delay of 100 milliseconds. Um, this happens because, contrary to five of our senses that have dedicated areas in the brain to pro for processing, there is no such area for temporal processing. So brain has to wait for information from four, five of our senses in order to build the best possible picture about the outside world. And since we have different brains, we are all different, we have different brains, this means that all of us have different temporal perception. Well, uh, when uh, Albert Einstein tried to explain his relativity theory, he said that a man traveling in a spaceship with the speed of light will perceive time differently from a person standing on the Earth. The current state of the neuroscience tells us that two people standing next to each other on the Earth can still perceive time completely different. Imagine one situation. You spent, maybe you had this situation, I don't know. You spent days, weeks, maybe months to employ your performance optimization strategy. You see the numbers are really good. You push the things to the server, but neither your boss nor your customers notice any difference. What's going on here? In the beginning of the 19th century, German physician Ernst Weber, and later his student Gustav Fachner, postulated a set of laws that are uh, in total now known as weber fachner law that is still considered to be the cornerstone of understanding how human perception works. This law defines so-called just noticeable difference, abbreviated as GND, um, defining the just noticeable difference between two stimuli, for example, difference between two weights or difference between two powers of light. And time is no exception to weber fachner law. Experiments, though, uh, show that for these short periods of time, of up to 30 uh, seconds, and these are the times that we are particularly interested in when we talk about web development, 
So for these short periods of time, Weber Fachner law can be uh, simplified into 20% rule. What does it mean to us as web developers? Let's assume you have an event that your customers are not happy with, for example, page loading time. So in order for your customers to notice any difference after your performance optimizations, you have to reduce this page loading time by at least 20%. Everything that goes beyond this, so 15%, for example, most of, the user, of your users will just not notice. There is one catch here. We are talking about noticeable difference. Noticeable doesn't necessarily mean meaningful. In order for your users to appreciate what you do to, your, to the performance of your website, you have to go well beyond 20%. But I don't know, maybe it's a hangover or maybe some skepticism I see in the eyes of some of you. Uh, probably you think that 20% um, is already more than enough for an average user to notice the difference. And then I have an example for you. I will show you two versions of the same web page. One before optimization and one after optimization. I will not tell you where is which. I can swap them, I can do them in the correct order. But it will be your task to tell me how you personally think what page is faster. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Wake up, please, people. So let's start. Page number one. Page number two. Uh, who thinks that page number one was faster? Yeah, like 20, 30 percent? Who thinks that page number two was faster? Um, yes, yeah, something like 5 percent maybe. Who thinks that they are equal? Yes, yeah, some people think the same. OK. Who thinks that this is matrix and this side doesn't exist? It doesn't exist. I made it up. So, but let's see how these sites load side by side. We start them at the same time. So, site number one was faster. The question is how faster? What difference do we talk about here? Like 50 milliseconds? 100 milliseconds? Anybody? Any guess? No guesses. Okay. We are talking about difference between 1.6 seconds and 2 seconds. 400 milliseconds difference. And still, not everybody can spot this difference. This is totally normal because temporal processing is different. And temporal judgments and temporal perceptions are really hard to relate to, especially when they happen close to each other in time. So far, what I'm talking about today might sound really depressive. Like, we cannot rely on absolute numbers. Our brain is cheating us. And not all of our performance optimizations are even noticeable by our customers. That's quite sad. So probably we should just stop doing performance optimizations, just stop doing web, go outside, go home, and just like forget about this. It's useless. Nobody sees this. But we all have jobs. And I, want all of us to keep these jobs and still get paid for what we are doing. So let's turn our depression into the opportunities. Let's get back to this 20% rule. We said that in order for your customer to notice any difference, you have to reduce the page loading time by at least 20%. The same rule works for regression allowance. So let's assume you have an event, for example, page loading time. But here we're working on a feature that slows down this event. What we usually do in this situation, we start fighting. We start fighting for every millisecond that we lost. But applying the rule of 20%, we can say that as long as your regression fits into the 20%, you, most of your users will not notice any slowdown anyway. So it's totally safe to push the feature to the server and get back to fighting for your milliseconds when you have time for that. The point is, of course, we can argue that, you know, fighting for milliseconds is still worth. We can fight for 50 milliseconds here, 50 milliseconds there, and in total, we will get a really good performance optimization improvement. And I do agree. The problem is that 
all of the performance optimization techniques require time. Time that your users might not be willing to give you now. So with this technique, I'm giving you the tool that helps to cut the corners before getting back and fixing things for real. Since we are talking about performance, time, and brain, let's see how our brain perceives time in general. German philosopher Martin Heidegger writes this about time. Time persists merely as a consequence of the events taking place in space. So let's see how our brain perceives one single event, this molecule of time. From a psychological point of view, every event consists of two phases, active phase and passive phase. Active phase is characterized by mental activity. It might be pure mental activity, it might be mental activity related to physical activity, but nevertheless, your brain is in on mode. Contrary to this, in the passive phase, our brain is idling. There is no control over the process and there are no options rather than just cancel the event altogether. When your customers complain about long times, for example, some events taking a long time, most probably they refer to exactly this passive phase because due to mental activity, active phase is not considered a weight at all by the user. Moreover, the research at MIT shows that people in the passive phase tend to overestimate the time they, were sp they spent waiting by 36%. Using some techniques and using this knowledge that active phase is good, passive phase is bad, within the same event, we can manage the balance between two phases so that we extend the good part for the cost of the bad part. There are multiple techniques to manage this balance, but we are going to talk about two simplest ones that most of the techniques boil down to. So the first technique of managing perception is called preemptive start. Let's assume you have an event that you want to make shorter or faster in the user's perception. In preemptive start technique, in the beginning of this event, we insert the active phase. Let's get to examples. And I will begin with the, um, with the offline example that I will never get tired of. Probably some of you have heard about it, but nevertheless, it's still a good example. In 2009, the Air administration of airport in Houston faced an unusual type of uh, complaint from the passengers. The passengers were complaining about long baggage handling time. Administration said, okay, we will fix this. They increased the number of stuff on the handling uh, line that reduced the overall baggage handling time to eight minutes. Everybody who is traveling with the planes knows that from the moment the plane is landed, or rather got to the gate, to the moment the first bags show up on the baggage carousel, eight minutes is really nothing. For example, the fastest baggage handling time in the UK happens in Manchester airport, and it's only 12 minutes. So eight minutes was really good. But surprisingly enough, the number of complaints remained the same. So administration decided, okay, we will investigate the case, and they checked out, and indeed, it was eight minutes from the uh, plane got to gate to the uh, moment the bags got on the baggage handling carousel. Eight minutes. But for an average person to get from the plane to the baggage carousel, it took only one minute. One minute of walking, active phase. And the remains, remaining seven minutes, the passenger had to stand by the line waiting. Seven minutes of passive phase. Employing the techniques of psychological time management, the administration came with an elegant and really trivial solution. They started routing the arrival planes to the gate further from the baggage carousel. And now, an average person, an average passenger, required to go for six minutes from the plane to the baggage carousel. Six minutes of the active phase, and only two minutes of passive phase standing and waiting for the bag. Guess what? The number of complaints dropped to zero. People didn't mind going longer if they wait less. This is nice, this is offline, but do we have anything closer to online? Well, not particularly online, but still application development. Uh, Safari on, mobile Safari on iOS has this feature called preload top hits. How does it work? So we type in the URL, and here are the two things that we have to note. First is this top hit line. 
really trivial feature available in any uh, web browser based on the browsing of your browser history, browsing history, excuse me. Uh, Safari tries to guess what site you mean. Really trivial. But there is another thing that we have to note here. Network, network activity uh, indicator. What does it mean? This means that while you're typing your URL, Safari tries to guess the site that you're gonna, uh, that you want to get to. And at the same time, in the background, Safari is already preloading this site so that when you're done typing in your URL, the site is almost instantly in your browser so that you wait as little as possible. Uh, another thing that helps us manage the psychological performance, this new specification called Resource Hints. It is technical solution, right? This is just um, what you do really technically. But it has the aim exactly at managing the psychological time. It's just the regular link with a special rel attribute that you put in either in the head of your document or inject with JavaScript. I will just briefly get through them. Um, there is the link at the bottom here where you find the cheat sheet on all the um, resource hints and what they do. But I will just briefly uh, go through them. So DNS prefetch, um, it establishes DNS connection with the resource that will be needed later on the page. Pre-connect establishes the full handshake connection with the, with the domain for a resource later on the page. So a bit worse support, unfortunately, but prefetch prefetches the resource that you will need later during the navigation. This, uh, this resource has really low pri priority because it's quite expensive for the browser to perform. Pre-render. It does what it does. It says pre-render, so it pre-renders a resource in the background. Of course, it's still expensive. Uh, and support is, unfortunately, Firefox doesn't support it yet. I think it doesn't support it yet. And the new kit uh, in, the, in the band, preload. This preloads an, a resource of a specified type without executing it. So preloads it in the background again. Only uh, um, Chrome and Opera do support it yet. But these things, being technical, still help to manage perception, because they get resources even before users need it, reducing the waiting time when they will have a need for them. So this is preemptive start technique. When we start doing things before users even realize that they are already waiting. Another technique called early completion, the same thing. We have an event that we want people to perceive as shorter one. But in this case, we put active phase at the end of the event. What are the examples? Well, probably one of the best examples on the, uh, on the internet, any, web, uh, any video streaming service, like YouTube, for example. It all starts with a passive phase. We click the button. Some progress indicator is showing up. And the uh, video begins downloading process in the background. So you're sitting and waiting. You have no other options rather than just close the tab. So you are in a passive phase. But you don't wait for the whole movie or video to be downloaded in order to start watching it. Once the first chunk of the video is ready to be viewed in your video player, the playback starts. And at this moment, the user is switched into the active phase because the brain is mentally active. Brain is mentally active cons consuming the information shown up in the player. And users do not notice the remaining time of the event being going on in the background. So the whole movie is still being downloaded in the background, but users don't notice it. Uh, another example of uh, early completion technique is optimistic UI. Who is familiar with optimistic UI technique? Raise your hands, please. Seriously. Wow, OK. This is, this is the second time this week. I was surprised with the same answer at the Smashing Conference. And OK, um, let me tell you about optimistic UI then. So um, in the uh, good old days, how the interactions on the websites work. So user clicks a button. We switch to disable, mo uh, disable state, send the request to the server or API, get response from the server, and update the state of the button. OK, nothing really optimistic in this UI. So it's not optimistic UI. 
In the not so old days, we have invented spinners. And now interactions started looking like, OK, user clicks the button. We show some sort of progress indicator or a spinner or something like this. We still make the API call, get response, and update the state of the button. Done. A bit better, but still not so optimistic UI. Now, what is optimistic UI? By default, we assume that almost 98% of users' interaction, interactions with your site will, will end up in success. So in optimistic UI, after user clicks, we immediately update the state of the button into the success state. In the background, we still make the API call, and we wait for the response from the server. But we update the state of the button only in case there comes an error from the server. This way, your system doesn't stand in front of the user. It doesn't block it. It doesn't disturb it. User has a really good fl flow of actions. And hence, can we say that this is actually psychological performance optimization? Undoubtedly so, because users don't wait. Users go on. They don't experience any wait at all, even though the original event getting to the server, getting the response, is still there. We don't do anything about it. Another technique for early completion, completion technique, critical path optimization. Let's do it again. Who is familiar with critical path optimization technique? Wonderful. OK. Um, so for those who are not familiar, what is critical path? It's literally everything that stands between your user and the content of your site. So it's all the blocking elements, like HTML, JavaScript, CSS, images, all these things. So the purpose of the critical path optimization technique is to reduce the path between user and the content, ideally to just one HTML. So what are the actions of this technique? Um, first of all, you find the critical CSS that is required to render the, just the top part of your site. You identify that in line in, in HTML. You asynchronously load the remaining CSS. You asynchronously load JavaScript. You defer execution of JavaScript, and so on and so on. There are multiple techniques, a lot of things that can be done for optimization, optimizing the critical path. But does it have anything to do with psychological optimization again? Of course it does. We reduce the time user is waiting to see the meaningful content of your site. And now let's get back to our Gizmodo example. But now we will check the progress of the pages loading. So of course it starts with a wide screen, passive mode, passive wait. We have no other option rather than just wait or close the tab. But as we can see, the first content is being rendered on the screen as soon as 1.5 seconds. Before this point, the user is in passive phase. User is sad. Once we start getting content, we start getting meaningful titles on the page, the user's brain is switched into the active mode and starts consuming the information. And hence, the user just doesn't notice those 20 seconds that we saw on the data. So 20 seconds keep going in the background, but users just don't notice them. This is the early completion technique. This is nice when we have active face in our events, but what do we do when there is none? Well, we invent one. In more or less large cities around the world, when you get to a busy road and want to cross it, you have to press the crossing button. The funny thing, though, is that in really large cities like New York and London, most of these buttons do nothing. For example, in central London, the interval between red light and green light is progr operated programmatically. And pushing this button makes any influence on this interval only when it's pressed from midnight to 7 AM. The rest of the day, you can press as many times as you want. The question is, why would anybody put these placebo buttons on the crossings? Well, from a psychological point of view, the process of standing on the crossing and waiting to cross the street is pure passive wait. You have no control over this wait. And you have no other options. Well, crossing the street on the red light is not an option, trust me. And never, ever do this in Italy. It's crazy. <laughs> so 
you are in passive mode, right? And we say that in passive mode, our brain doesn't have control over the process. Once it gains control, or even illusion of control, the brain is immediately switched into the active mode. And these placebo buttons give us exactly that. It gives us the illusion of control, that we control something. So this helps us tolerate the weight on the crossings much easier. With the same principles work the mirrors in the elevators. They switch the whole passive weight of standing in, in the elevator going up or down with some active phase, active weight, when you can see in the mirror, pick at each other, and so on. This is, again, offline. Do we have any examples in online of the event without active phase? Well, we do. Those of you who do some presentations or maybe presentations in the company or in, in the companies or conferences um, are probably familiar with the services like SlideShare, where you upload your presentation file and share it with the outside world. How does it work? It all starts with uploading a file. And uploading a file to a server is a pure passive phase. You have no control over that. You have no other options rather than cancel the upload altogether. So how does SlideShare deal with this? While the file is being uploaded, SlideShare provides you with the form to fill with meta information about your presentation, like title, description, keywords, and so on and so on. And this is active phase. In my particular case, when I was done with this active phase of filling out the form, it was because I was mentally active, I filled out the form. My passive phase, the uploading of the file, was already done in the background. So I didn't experience any weight at all. So SlideShare really nicely manages this active passive bal uh, weight balance. What I told you so far today is just the tip of the iceberg. There is much, much more to psychological performance optimization. But with this talk, I would like you to add psychological performance optimization as another tool in your developer's toolbox. Because even in the documentation for macOS developers from Apple, they write the following. The perception of performance is just as effective as actual performance in many cases. So next time you face a need for performance optimization, please put the user in the middle of your considerations. Look outside of the box, outside of the box of absolute numbers, industry recommendations, outside of technological limitations. Do not fight for milliseconds. Fight for your users. Know what your users want. And then next time, it may be up to you to answer the question, how long is forever? Thank you.